This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Welcome. This is Craig Thomas, your host on Much More in Medicine, part of Think Tech Hawaii's live stream program and assisted, as always, by Rich and Ray, our engineers. And joining me today, or welcoming back, is Dr. Diana Felton. She is a State of Hawaii toxicologist. And I'm really pleased you're here because last time we had a number of interesting topics uh, related to Hawaii's unique environment, uh, volcanoes mostly. Uh, today, we're going to talk about sort of a sneaky, insidious toxin that affects many parts of the world and at least to some degree here, and that's lead. Uh, tell me about it. Yeah, well, thanks for having me today, Craig. Happy to talk about lead. Uh, lead is a metal. Um, there's no natural or physiologic use of lead in the human body, so lead is considered a toxin even in very, very small amounts. And it's been a problem of public health focus for a long time. And there is often a misperception that we don't have as much problems with lead poisoning here in Hawaii, but we still do have lead poisoning here in Hawaii. And lead is particularly interesting because it's really most harmful to children. What does it do? So lead interferes with a number of really important processes in the bodies, in particular at very low levels, it interferes with some of the brain development. And so the problems that occur from exposure to level, lead, lower levels of lead are really sort of quiet at first, but then show themselves later. So they tend to cause problems with IQ, lowering IQ, poor school performance, hyperactivity, cognitive problems, and really slow executive functioning and you know higher level development type problems. So that sounds to me like A, bad stuff, and B, tricky to detect because maybe I'm just a little dumb. But uh, maybe it was the lead. And pretty clearly on a population uh, basis, if a whole group of people are exposed to lead and do poorly as a result, this is both an individual and societal problem. That's absolutely correct. And it makes it difficult to detect because many children with lead poisoning that will affect their school readiness or their ability to perform at school may not have obvious symptoms that you would see at times when they're sensitive to the lead, particularly around the ages of one or two years old, which is when the brain is the most sensitive to lead. So because of that, there's been a lot of work with public health agencies of trying to identify kids who are being exposed to lead and decrease their exposure to prevent lead poisoning. I'm trying to decide, you know what, I was trying to decide about recent history and sort of historically. I'd actually like a little picture of where have we been exposed to lead over the years, and then let's talk about uh, some developments of the last couple of years, and then specifically Hawaii. Sure. So most lead exposure that has caused problems for kids, both in the past and even still today, is related to lead-based paint. So paint has historically had lead in it, helps it be durable and shiny, It's very useful in paint, but it causes this major public health problem. So it was banned in 1978 for most uses, particularly in residential settings. Lead paint is still used in some outdoor structures like bridges, used in, in marine settings like boats, there's still lead paint, but in your house you're not allowed to use lead paint anymore. But plenty of houses that were built before 1978 still have lead paint. So that's traditionally been a big place of exposure and continues to be. And I would point out that even if they got repainted after 1978, if the paint is flaking off, you're getting to the deep layers, which may well contain lead. Exactly. And then traditionally also uh, leaded gasoline was a major source of lead, particularly in cities, around roadways, um, and in places where cars were frequent. That has been banned since the late 80s, and so we've really seen a decrease in the ambient lead amounts since that has happened. But that lead never really leaves the environment, it just disperses more. But we don't have lead in gasoline anymore, which is a good thing. So I'm pretty sure lead paint was banned in 78, is that correct? That's right. Uh, I did actually hear an interesting, slightly macabre thing, which is they can tell by your skeleton 
sort of what era you were born in because they can detect the tetraethyl lead from gasoline if you were if your bones developed before it was removed from gasoline which i guess was the late 80s that's, so that's a little macabre but yeah. interesting and the lead after the lead gets into your body it then will end up depositing in the bone yes and it stays in the bones and it can stay for years and decades and um, will slowly sort of work its way back out so the exposures to lead can be really long-lasting, even if your source was, you know, short-term in the beginning. Got it. Um, so more recently, I, we all heard about Flint, Michigan. And as I recall, uh, the acute crisis was precipitated by putting some somewhat acidic river water through probably century-old pipe that was made out of lead. And this sort of washed off the the protective coating on the inside of the pipe and a big spike in lead levels and it took a while and there were some issues about detection. Uh, what was all that about? Yeah, that's interesting that you bring that up. It's certainly been in the news a fair bit. And what they found was uh, it was actually detected, I believe, by public health authorities who noticed the increase in the elevated but not super high levels of lead in large numbers of children in the Flint area. And that was how they picked up on the problem. Unfortunately, there were some problems with some of the communications and some of the public relations that they had during that time. So that sort of became a big issue. But the end result was that there were a lot of children that got exposed to lead to a degree that may harm their school yeah, performance. Horrible. Yeah. And we're lucky here in Hawaii, we really are not aware of any significant lead problems in our drinking water here in Hawaii. Good. So there was a law passed in, uh, a federal law passed in um, 1988 called the Lead and Copper Rule that requires the uh, water companies to test water at the taps of a certain percentage of their, of their customers and really don't find exceedances or increases here in Hawaii. So there still is always the question of the pipes that serve the municipal water to your house, um, in particular if it's an old, you know, built before 1988 when those were no longer allowed to be led. But for the most part, our municipal water, particularly here in Oahu with the Board of Water Supply and in other parts of Hawaii, have not had significant amounts of lead in them, which is fantastic. Are there any issues with uh, non-municipal water? well or catchment or uh, sources yeah, like that? It's a very good question and particularly on, uh, on the Big Island um, in areas where the volcanic emissions were affecting people um, oftentimes there's acid rain related to the uh, sulfuric acid that's created from some of the emissions from the volcano mm -hmm. and when the acid was getting into some of some people's catchment systems it was causing lead to leach out of the pipes and can lead to lead in the water in the catchment systems. So it's very important if you have private water, wells, catchments, that you test frequently for lead. And there's information how to do that on the Department of Health website. Um, and it's very important, especially during periods of unsettled environmental so, conditions. <laughs> what? <laughs> Unsettled environment, uh, I think we're going to be looking, have been looking at a lot, and we'll be looking at a lot more unsettled environment. Um, so in sort of the mechanism there was actually in some ways similar to the Flint one. The water is acidic, it dissolves the metal, and so you get uh, ionic metal basically, uh, metal ions floating around in the water, and you can drink them. That's exactly right. And then we have a few other interesting sort of Hawaii-related uh, risks that we are always concerned about. Um, lead fishing weights are a big source of exposure for kids in Hawaii. They're fun to play with. They're very common. You find them at the beach, in the ocean, and those are made of lead. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, kids playing with lead fishing weights, families smelting a bunch of lead down to make weights, those are all also sources of exposure. Ammunition well. too, probably smelting yeah. down. I, I, some people make their own bullets and things. Yeah. So absolutely, and then we also like to think about some of the more esoteric but still prevalent causes of lead exposure, um, which are things. There's often um, like ceremonial religious equipment, um, some folk medicine, folk makeup. Uh, 
There are um, certain supplements and herbs that will contain lead. And there's even been significant amount of lead found in certain spices, particularly coming from India and Bangladesh. Uh, that's not good. And I seem to remember a couple years ago, I think they were kind of high-end wooden toys that were painted with uh, lead, uh, paint that had significant lead. Now, I don't mean this was legal, but in fact, it, I think it escaped notice and got into some distribution. Yeah. Um, uh, I did hear of a case where a family liked two things. Uh, uh, crystal decanter and orange juice. It's a bad combination. Uh, again, the acid leached the lead from the crystal and the lead is what makes crystal so sparkly. So uh, uh, there are weird point sources. It, uh, there are and it's often a big source of mystery for us mm -hmm. um, at the Department of Health when we're trying to investigate these cases and figure out what the exposure is so that we can help the families remove the exposure and decrease the kids' lead levels. And interestingly, uh, although not the focus of this morning, uh, lead affects other vertebrates and possibly invertebrates, I don't know, but other animals as well. And I've spent time out at Midway in some of the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, and there's a condition out there called droopling, which affects albatross chicks and it's related to them uh, getting lead poisoned. And they get lead poisoned because there are old structures out there, the paint is flaking off, they peck around in the ground, and uh, it's pretty sad. The birds look great. They grow, they look really good, except that their wings are droopy, and they never fly away. And in the end, of course, they can't survive without flying away, so uh, it matters. It matters to us, and it, matters to uh, the creatures we share the state with. That's exactly right. Um, how significant a problem do you think we have and sort of what are the levels we're looking for? Sure. So the honest answer is that we don't know exactly the degree of problem that we have here in Hawaii. And the reason for that is a lot of our lead poisoning prevention work has been fund, traditionally funded by the CDC mm -hmm. and still is, but there was a gap in funding for many years. And it's really been in the last year that the program's been refunded to a significant degree and really revamped. Was that the Flint effect, do you think? or? You know, that's a good question. I'm not certain. It's possible that that played a role. There's certainly been a movement from the federal government about lead poisoning. In fact, just a few weeks ago, the uh, White House released a special report about a federal action plan for investigating lead and reducing lead exposure and lead poisoning. So our program here had, through the Department of Health, and it's, a, it's through multiple divisions in the Department of Health, has really revamped over the past year and just done some remarkable work in moving forward. In addition to that, the CDC recently lowered their level of concern for children. So it used to be 10 micrograms per deciliter and has been decreased down by half to five. So that's the blood lead level that we start to get concerned about. You know, after the break, we're going to talk about testing and the fact that I at least probably had a level of 10 when I was a kid, given my era and the things that were going on then. And uh, we'll talk about these things in a minute. So Great. thank you very much. This is a Much More in Medicine. We'll look forward to rejoining you after the break. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Choose to treat it with the help of a physical therapist. Physical therapists treat pain through movement and exercise. No warning labels required. And you get to actively participate in your care. Choose to improve your health without the risks of opioids. Choose physical therapy. Aloha, I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock, live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're going to be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, let's take healthy back. Aloha. Welcome back. This is Craig Thomas, your host on Much More in Medicine, and with me is Dr. 
uh, Diana Felton, who is the state toxicologist. And it's great to have you here. And before the break, we were talking uh, in general about issues about lead, and we were just getting to what's the state doing? And uh, where's your focus? What are you concerned about? How can we implement uh, prevention measures? So where are we at? Sure. So it's pretty exciting, the work that the state has done over the last year with being uh, sort of revamping the Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention Program. So it's the Hawaii version of that, so we call it HICLIP, which is the acronym. And HICLIP is a multidisciplinary effort within the Department of Health to really has sort of multiple components. One is identifying children that are poisoned with lead, with lead, then tracking them and tracking, looking for any sort of patterns in the public health matter, and then following up with them, making sure that the source is identified, trying to help families understand how to reduce the source, and then also oftentimes referring these children to treatments that we know work for lead poisoning, such as early intervention, sometimes individualized education plans or whatever else the kids may need going forward to try to compensate for the, for the lead exposure on their school preparedness and school performance. So how big a problem is there, do you think? What, what kind of testing are we doing looking for kids? Obviously, if you know there's a source and there's a child there, it makes sense to look. But I suspect that often there isn't an obvious source. Yeah, and we have guidelines based on the C CDC recommendations. And the guideline is a questionnaire that the patient's pediatrician or child's primary care provider would, would ask, would go over with the family, and it's recommended at nine months and two years. And it goes through a list of things that would make a child at risk for lead poisoning. Mm -hmm. So has another sibling ever had a positive lead level? Um, are there any exposures in the home, such as old paint? Is the house built before 1978? There's also uh, zip codes that are considered higher risk for lead poisoning. So do you live in a high-risk zip code? Does a family member work in any industry that might expose you to lead? And a number of other things on the questionnaire. And then if the children screen into that questionnaire, then it's recommended they get a blood lead level test done. But we do not have universal testing of kids in Hawaii, which is something different from many other states. So many other states recommend or actually require testing of all children at ages one and two. In addition, Medicaid, uh, if you're on Medicaid, you're supposed to be tested at nine months and two years. However, so tested, not screened. Correct. Okay. However, in Hawaii, even in, among our Medicaid population, only about 30% of the kids are getting tested. So we really have a problem in that we don't know how big our problem is because we haven't had enough testing done. So that's been a big push from the Department of Health and the Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention Program to really encourage more testing so we can get a sense of, of what we're dealing with. Yes, I mean, it, the, it seems to me that relying on a screen is dependent on the sensitivity of the screen. And based on the fact we don't have a big baseline level of testing, is I think that's probably hard to know. And it makes me wonder if instead of devoting effort to the screen, we just did the test for a while to see where we were at, I think we'd probably have some surprises. I think you're absolutely right. And certainly test, doing the blood tests on more kids would really advance our understanding of the problem and help us understand how best to help the kids and prevent the poisoning cases. To me, this is an important area to focus on because you won't find it if you don't look and the long-term impacts are real but hard to trace back to the, the issue and so you kind of have to look to find out. What in general can people do to minimize the risk of exposure themselves, their kids, even their albatross? Well, that's probably <laughs> not a problem. Well, that's a great question, Craig, and it's really helps just to think a little bit about your environment and um, how a kid around you or even yourself might be exposed to lead. So particularly if you live in an older home, think about the paint. Is it paint peeling on the inside? And even a, a lot of another big source in Hawaii particularly is the soil around houses. So if the exterior paint uh, is peeling, and which often does because of our environment, 
and the lead in the paint has gotten into the soil, it's then in the soil and in the dust, and that soil and dust gets on kids' hands, gets tracked into the house, the kids run around on the floor, etc. So even just really good wet mopping, keeping surfaces clean of dust, making sure there's no peeling paint or paint chips, and washing hands really carefully before eating and drinking can really help decrease the exposure to lead for everyone in the family. You know, I'd forgotten about something until just now. Years ago, we had a wonderful little parakeet that flew into our lives from <laughs> flying out of somebody else's life, no doubt. And we had it for some years, and we went on a trip. And we uh, gave the bird to some friends uh, while we were gone. And by the time we got back, the bird was really sick. And so we uh, took it to the vet, took an x-ray. The bird was full of lead chips. And it had been pecking away at the windowsill, which it was an old home, uh, which clearly several layers down had lead paint. Sadly, the bird died. But it demonstrates uh, how ubiquitous this can be. And it also makes a good point in that even if your house is new, you might want to consider other places where your kids spend a significant amount of time, such as a family member's house or a friend's house. Um, there are you know, lots of places throughout the community where lead could be present. So important to think about all those possibilities when evaluating if your child might be at risk. To me, this is all an argument for screening. I, I, and by screening, I mean testing. I don't mean questionnaire because Maybe the questionnaire is all benign, but as you say, uh, the child spends a significant time in a house like my friends were living in at the time. And um, uh, you would never find that on a questionnaire. And fortunately, the technology for lead testing is getting better. So a lot of times it can be done just in the doctor's office, um, briefly, quickly. It's not a perfect test, and there are some problems. They have to then be confirmed with a true blood tests mm -hmm. if they're elevated, but the screening, the basic screening can be done fairly quickly and easily in many situations. So is it, what sample is required? So currently... For the, for the screening test. For the quick screening test, they're using point of care tests for just capillary testing, so it's just a finger prick. A poke, yeah. Yeah, and that makes it a lot easier to do the screening. You do have to be careful because there can be some uh, problems with false positives, so mm -hmm. the test will come out high and then you'll verify it with a true venous test and it will be normal. But it's still useful in screening because you can eliminate a lot of kids when it's normal. And false positives, although alarming sometimes and require an additional test, uh, are not that huge a deal. So you tell the parent, we're going to do this test. Uh, sometimes it's inaccurate on the positive side, in which case we do a confirmative test, and if it's normal, there's no issue. Exactly. Um, so for a screening test, that's okay. Um, what would it take, do you think, to screen all nine-month-old children? That's a good question. So probably it would take uh, a change in the law uh -huh. um, through the legislature. And also I think really important would take the buy-in of the pediatric community here mm -hmm. in Hawaii. So. Sure. Um, you know, having some further discussions with uh, pediatricians, family care practitioners, um, and talking about the usefulness not only to their individual patients, but also to the collective good and the data set and the importance of the public health part of it um, would be interesting. One uh, idea that's been tossed out would be to try to require a brief period of time where we did universal testing, so three years or to so. To see where you're at. To see where you are. And this has been piloted in some other states with a lot of success. They've really mm -hmm. found some problems they did not expect, found other places where they thought there was a problem and there wasn't, so really helped them refine mm -hmm. their both their prevention strategies and also their treatment strategies. And pretty clearly, the underlying rate of whatever it is you're looking for in the end, drives whether it's worth testing for. But if you don't know it, you have to do some sort of baseline analysis. Just thinking about the pediatricians, family practitioners, nurse practitioners who are caring for these children, I suspect buy-in could be facilitated if the program was supported by infrastructure, perhaps the point of care uh, devices, um, to support, to, to facilitate the process, because uh, what doctors tend to resist are sort of 
unfunded mandates, um, but which, you know, you wish we all did the right thing for our patients, but the truth is, if there are barriers, it's harder to get it to happen. Um, but I would love to see, at very least, a baseline statewide testing of small children, at least till we know where we should be looking and where we shouldn't, and does the, the questionnaire screen work or not? My sense is, uh, it must miss some. You know, if it's uh, uh, crystal uh, decanter or a, oh, a, a religious uh, device or a, I don't know, herb from Bangladesh, uh, probably not going to find those on a screening questionnaire. So, um, or just staying at somebody else's house. Um, in the last couple minutes, let's talk about where you'd like to see this go and what people can do both personally but also uh, as a voice in their community for uh, trying to increase lead awareness and abatement and uh, impact the health of our community. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think awareness is number one, particularly for people with young children, talking with their healthcare providers about lead, um, talking with their friends and other family members. And um, some of the things we talked about earlier about you know, keeping a lower dust environment, making sure the paint isn't deteriorating on your wall, and just kind of being conscious of the potential risk. Uh, of course, regular health checkups with your child are very important. And then, in addition, there is, um, you know, there's work to be done through the legislature. And there's a couple of bills about lead poisoning prevention currently in this year's legislative session that if this is of interest to people, they can talk to their legislatures about. And for more information, there's a oh, ton of really excellent uh, resources and information on the Department of Health website. It's actually on the website related to the Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention Program. What's the URL for the overall website? I'm sure people can click down to the menu. Yeah, so the... it's doh.hawaii.gov. Perfect. Is the Department of Health, and then the uh, subtext would be the High Clip website. And they've just revised it somewhat, and it's just got a ton of information, handouts, brochures, studies, everything that can t help you figure out where things might be at risk and also where, how, what to do about it. You know, I really appreciate you coming today. Uh, it's nice to hear that, that uh, you're focusing on a problem that affects our keiki, and uh, especially one that's not visible, uh, but is real. So uh, thank you all for joining us. This is Dr. Diana Felton, a state toxicologist. and. If you're interested in the uh, pursuing this on the website, again, it was? doh.hawaii.gov. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us.